All right, hey, hey, y'all. Um, I'm really excited about today because I'm going to be talking about Baudrillard's third book, which is, for me, where he starts to get the most interesting and then where he starts to move away. And, of course, there are traces of this in his previous two. But he starts to move away here from psychoanalysis, from Marxism, from semiotics, to try and craft his own domain. Whether or not he's successful at that over the, you know, the next 30 books that he that he published or got published, uh, certainly up for debate if he is actually able to do that for himself. Now, with the version I'm working with, it's uh, the Telos Press um, version, which can be found online. And it, I I bring this up because it has a very uh, well written introduction by the translator Charles Levin. It's a very complicated introduction, and as far as secondary research goes, secondary lit on Baudrillard's work, it can often fall short, it often makes strange, or they often make strange kind of truest remarks, ideas pertaining to, uh, I guess, the teleological shift between reality and simulation, kind of supposing that there is, in fact, a shift, uh, but that, that's a topic we'll get to uh, later on. All this to say that what Charles Levin does with this introduction is, is very interesting because he gives a very powerful overview of Baudrillard's central ideas that remain what I believe to be pretty faithful to Baudrillard's project up until 1982. So that'd be up until about simulacrum simulation. But the first kind of point that, that I want to elaborate uh, or that Charles Levin brings up is that goes as follows. It is with the mirror of production, so the book that actually follows this one, that Baudrillard utterly discards any hope that a robust critique is possible from a legitimately Marxist standpoint, which is certainly very interesting, and it's something that we're going to get at later. But I'm kind of bringing this up now as a preamble, as a sort of preface, to the moments that Baudrillard does away with traditional, and air quotes, kind of Marxist thought in this book. Now, important note is that this book, for a critique of the political economy of the sign, which is certainly a mouthful, is not a book per se. It's actually a collection of essays. But in relation to other collections of essays, in Baudrillard's corpus and in other thinkers' corpus, uh, in their oops, um, there is a, a very coherent thread through it. He does develop an argument, and it does re really come out in this, and, it, and it's, it makes it a pleasure to read. It doesn't feel as choppy, as aphoristic, as, as sort of scattered as, you know, some other uh, essay collections of any, any given author. Which is, it, it certainly makes it um, very good to read. It gives it uh, a certain quality that, that often lacks. So, without, without getting too much into um, what Charles Levitt says, because, you know, there's a lot there, it's rather dense, um, and it does serve as more of like an overview, I really just want to, you know, give him credit. And for those people that might want to read the book, be sure to read the intro, don't skip over it, because it really, you know, prefaces the book well. And it prefaces Baudrillard's ideas, where they're going to go, where they've come from, in relation to this particular text, which can certainly ground um, a reading of it in almost any way. Whether you want to read it from a Marxist perspective or any of that sort, anything that Baudrillard claims to move beyond, notably critical theory. So, so what um, Charles Levin says of Baudrillard's use of critical theory, or his desire to pass through it, he says that to begin with, critical theory is always threatened by the temptation to puff itself up into a gigantic version of the sign, replete with its strategy of abstraction and reduction. This pitfall is implicit in the very, very activity of constructing a critical model of the object, in quotes which, in its claim to avoid passivity, must paradoxically stress its adequacy, excuse me, and therefore its identity 
with what it claims to transcend. But even the most aggressive model in, must, in principle, fall short of its object. Which is, I, there's so much there. But without, you know, this isn't about Charles Levin, so I don't want to spend too much time there, but it, I, I hope that this sort of been, uh, served as a pretty decent preface as to what's going on here. So the first chapter, chapter one, uh, is called Sign Function and Class Logic, which is perhaps not all that revolutionary if we, you know, we could see traces of this sort of idea in Marx, obviously, when we, when we think of capital. Um, where it's, you can't necessarily divide, kind of bifurcate, you can't very cleanly separate, you know, sign function or what I'll call exchange value, an idea that we'll get to in this text, uh, from, you know, the modes of production, from class, all these sorts of things. But Baudrillard will take this as an opportunity to move, take Marx further, to open it up to new possibilities effectively, you know, pointing to its limitations in the form of a, a critique. So he starts off this chapter by stating, an analysis of the social logic which, excuse me, an analysis of the social logic which regulates the practice, practice of objects according to diverse classes or categories cannot help but, but at the same time a critical analysis of the ideology of consumption that today underlies all practice relative to objects. So here we're seeing a trace of that, you know, theory worked out in the consumer society. What role does consumption play in the split between production and consumption? Where Baudrillard wants to think about these things, thinks about consumption, think about the system of objects in relation to consumption as opposed to their being produced, and what role they play in a, as a as mode of consumption. And therefore, Baudrillard sees an opportunity to bring that individual whatever we want to consider that, or the consumer into dialogue with this sort of framework. So this leads Baudrillard almost right off the bat, right off the bat to say that because, you know, we're working in the domain of signs, he says, this <laughs> empiricist hypothesis is false. That is, that objects are primarily a function of needs. Totally false for him, out the window, not even a, you know, not even a possibility, because that would imply that there is you know, a fundamental universal basic need that can then be satisfied through one universal basic object, um, thing in the world, signified, referent, which Baudrillard is totally absurd. It's, that would be um, just a, a joke. It, it would end thought at that point, which is very, you know, violent. So what Baudrillard tries to do at this point is bring into conversation symbolic exchange, or the potlatch and the kula, which it, it are indicative of, you know, what we believe to be pre-modern societies, whatever that might mean. Uh, and like I mentioned in the last video, there is a homogenizing tendency in Baudrillard's work which needs to be challenged, and we can't necessarily take them at face value and understanding different cultures, different different beliefs, um, but it, what he does with it certainly serves a purpose in the analysis of how signs, how meaning circulates. Now it's not simply attached to a very real thing, whether it be world or idea, um, but that it's, it's something that is open for exchange. And he does this with, as I just mentioned, the potlatch, which if we think of Mouse's, Marceau Mouse, and his uh, book, The Gift, he explores this phenomenon where the potlatch is the exchange of gifts, the exchange of goods, without the reciprocation, without necessarily an immediate reciprocation, there can be. But by giving a gift, one does not assume that they're going to be given a gift in exchange right away. In fact, there's almost like a benefit to having to wait. But the giving of a gift is always met, perhaps not immediately, perhaps later, perhaps not even in the same form, but will be met with a counter gift. And this counter gift have to, has to, in a sense, exceed the value of the initial gift. So what we can see with this kind of phenomenon is the 
you know, raising of the stakes, going back and forth. So in this framework, giving a gift, where one might initially assume that with losing something, with giving oneself up, actually places someone in a position of superiority. And an analogy that I like to use when thinking about this, or when talking about this, is let's say you go to dinner with your partner and your partner's parents. At the end of the dinner, I, w I would say a good portion of the time, the father, if there is one present, uh, will be paying for that dinner. Now, of course, there's a lot to consider with that. I'm assuming a nuclear family type framework, a heteronormative framework, but in either in this either case, I think that my point would stand in that what we see in that situation is not the giving of a gift for this for just out of total, I guess, um, inconsequentiality or uh, without the word is eluding me. Um, it's not unconditional. The giving of the gift or the buying of dinner in that situation reinforces, reifies in a sense, um, the superior position of the paternal figure in the family. So it doesn't just serve a single, you know, function in that it's the giving of a gift out of uh, a totally unconditional giving, but it serves a very certain social logic which can't be ignored, which is to say that our understanding of giving and receiving, you know, with, with mouse, was kind of thrown upside down. And Baudrillard follows that. So what <clears throat> Baudrillard writes, and he does this with a good deal of humility, is that alluding to primitive societies is undoubtedly dangerous. Good for him. It is nonetheless necessary to recall that originally the consumption of goods, elementary or sumptuary, does not appear to an individual economy of needs, but is a social function of prestige and hierarchical distribution. It does not derive primarily from vital necessity or from natural law, but from a cultural constraint. In summary, it is an illusion. A very, it's a very radical idea. Because it, it really throws things out of whack with how we understand receiving and giving, which I know I just said, but it's it's an idea that, you know, I work with a lot in you know, my head and I struggle with, but it's it's really it's really beautiful. So he kind of wraps this under the under the aegis of symbolic exchange. And of course in his later book, two books from now I believe, uh with his book, Symbolic Exchange of Death, we're going to get into this more and how that was sort of a response to Leotard. But that's uh, for another time. So Baudrillard takes this notion of symbolic exchange of the Kula potlatch and relates it to the work of Thorstein Veblen. Now, for those who are unfamiliar with Thorstein Veblen, uh, I'll, I think he's someone worth reading, perhaps just one book, uh, the Theory of the Leisure Class, written in 1899, I believe, or released in 1899, the end of the 19th century. Um, he wrote this book called The Theory of the Leisure Class, in which he coined a bunch of terms like conspicuous consumption. Um, you know, he didn't coin pecuniary decency, I don't believe. But he pretty much laid out the, the idea of the leisure class, like what kind of social logic it performed. And for him, his central thesis was that we believe, or we believed at the time, that the leisure class was the breakaway from, in his terms, barbarity. But in this, but what he says is that because it's still, you know, there's still all this attachment to um, competition in the form of pecuniary decency. There's still, um, and he, towards the end of the book, he talks about uh, university sports. And he talks about gambling and all this stuff, superstition. He says that we are still in this kind of barbaric mindset, which today is a term we'd want to avoid, but it's the one he uses, unfortunately. Uh, but that is that is his argument. Where, you know, what Baudrillard says of him is that Veblen was particularly effective 
at theorizing the economy, at theorizing class, because he didn't look at things from the standpoint of production, but looked at the, the consumption of objects and what role they played in, in performing social logic or the social setup of the time. To which um, Baudrillard says that, excuse me, um, the echo of this primordial function of objects is found enlarged in the notion of conspicuous waste, ostentatious prodigality, honorific consumption or expenditure in the analysis of Thorstein Veblen. Veblen shows that even if the primary function of the subservient classes is working and producing, they simultaneously have the function, and when they are kept unemployed, it is their only function of displaying the standing of the master. Women, the people, servants are thus the exhibition of status. Rendering people subservient plays this role where it makes people it not only renders people in a state of helplessness, of alienation from their selves, from their work, but it actually gives the people performing this oppression a certain authority, a certain class status that otherwise perhaps they wouldn't be able to attain, hence the very oppressive logic of this system. <laughs> so, this is just one of the many sociological perspectives that um, Baudrillard invokes in order to kind of hone in on this, this idea of sign function and class logic. So what he says, um, he, he furthers this idea by saying that it is well known that objects tell a great deal about the social, sta social status of their owner. But there we have a vicious cycle in the objects one identifies a social category which has, in the final analysis, already been described on the basis of these objects, among other criteria. The recurring induction hides a circular deduction. The specific social practice and the sociology's true object cannot be brought out by this operation, which is, you know, what is, what is the function of this sociological analysis? Where his question goes as follows, to what may a sociological analysis in this domain look forward. If it is to bring out a specular or mechanical relation between a given configuration of objects and a given position on the social scale, as Chapin does, it is devoid of interest. Which is like, um, is this is, it really seems like Baudrillard wanted to, at this point, kind of, what another author writes about, um, Another author named Roberto Colasso writes about Walter Benjamin. He says that Benjamin ultimately just wanted to disappear behind a wall of quotes, or like a sea of quotes, which is, you know, he's saying this out of great respect for Benjamin, but in a sense, I, I just see that with Baudrillard. I find it hard not to, I find it difficult not to just highlight everything. And I'm, you know, I'm a, a fanboy, and it's, it's bad, but... Uh, here I am. So the role of discourse, the role of language in this kind of social logic is something that can't necessarily be ignored, right? Because signs are inextricably linked with, you know, language. How we communicate those signs, what those signs mean, can't necessarily be elucidated without the role of language, so on and so forth. So Baudrillard obviously takes this consideration. So discourse must then be read in its class grammar in its class inflections, in the contradictions with its own social situation, which the individual or group directs through its discourse of objects. A correct sociological analysis must be exercised in the concrete syntax of objects ensembles, of object ensembles, equivalent to a story and liable to interpretation in terms of social destiny, just like the story of a dream in terms of unconscious conflicts which is an, an idea he's going to problem, problematize later on, but it's, I think it's an idea we can certainly get behind that if we're going to apply a certain sociological analysis, it has to be prepared to, because of its like most fundamental methodology or its methodo methodological criterion and that it has to be delivered through language. Um, in order to get at that, it has to adopt language. It has to meet it, or it has to meet the language of a certain system, right? The synchrony, if you will, the, the moment, the instantiation of language. 
or of that system. Which is certainly, a, it seems like a reasonable plea, a reasonable call. So finally, he says, the object of sociological analysis lies in the ultimately disparate or contradictory relationship of the discourse of objects to other social conducts, professional, economic, cultural. That is to say that it must avoid a phenomenological reading, the pictures of objects brought back to characteristics or social types, and the merely formal reconstitution of a code of objects, which is never spoken as such in any case, although it hides a strict social logic but is always restored and manipulated according to a logic peculiar to each social system. Now, Baudrillard's move away from a phenomenological analysis, and for those that aren't familiar, I guess it would be difficult for me to define phenomenology without just turning to, you know, the Stanford Encyclopedia, just because it has such a, a vibrant history. But what Baudrillard is trying to move away from is the, I guess, the broad classification of certain, of certain group of cer groups of certain identities that are given this classification, I guess, in response to a certain sociological analysis. So what happens in that situation is that the group is given, or the conditions for the sociological analysis are set forth in advance, so that in the analysis itself, the things that are wanted to be seen are seen, and things that are, you know, assumed to be the case are viewed to be the case. And this is certainly something that science in many ways is complicit in, in the taking of polls, of statistics, of surveys. There's often, it's very selective in what it wants to see. And then, in effect, it's very selective of what it does see, of what actually comes about. Which, perhaps not a very, uh, popular opinion, but it can't be ignored, but that that's something that'll come up in his later books, and I, I don't want, no spoilers, no, no spoilers. So, on the level, he states, on the level of objects, this rhetoric of despair is indicated by various stylistic modalities. They all derive from a logic and a, an aesthetic of simulation a simulation of the bourgeois models of domestic organization. So here, of course, you know, we're seeing this idea of simulation come about, something that he's probably the most famous for. In fact, I will say it is what he's the most famous for. But we are surely working within the realm of the simulation, given that, given his, you know, emphasis on the role of signs, of, you know, pecuniary decency of consumption of objects. We have to be... Uh, shift our logic to one of simulation. Shift our language to that, because if we approach these sorts of um, the, these phenomena, assuming there to be a very basic connection between, let's say, objects and production, or in other terms, between objects and the real moment of their conception, conception with a very real meaning behind their having been made, then we are approaching it in the wrong way for Baudrillard. We have to take this as a simulation and match that logic. We have to, if we're going to analyze it, if we're going to get to its core, we can't approach it from a different, like, methodological standpoint, from a different base from which it, it itself lies, or else we'd be on different terrain. And we wouldn't be able to actually, one would have to high ground, right? Think of that last scene in, you know, that Star Wars movie there, Revenge of the Sith. Is that the third one? Whatever. You know, Obi-Wan had the high ground, and then he was able to just lay down the law. So, the object then, in its inextric inextricable connection to the realm of signs, has, in its part, a certain connection to the realm of aesthetics, which Baudrillard attributes to the cultural Baroque. Now, what is that? What is the cultural Baroque? Its aesthetic value is always derived value. In it, the stigmata of industrial production and primary functions are eliminated. And for all these reasons, the taste for the bygone is characterized by the desire to transcend the dimension of economic success, to consecrate a social success, a privileged position, in a redundant culturalized symbolic sign. The bygone is, among other things, social success that seeks a legitimacy, a heredity, a noble sanction.
in that there is a, a certain search for origins, a certain looking for the, you know, the, the real value behind a given object, behind a certain string of objects, which if we think back to his first book, The System of Objects, uh, this comes out in the form of the antique object and our fascination with it. How the antique object gives us the semblance of originality, gives us the, the comfort that we can lose ourselves in sort of the cathartic energy expelled by the, you know, the cathartic energy expended by the antique object to retain its originality, whatever that might mean, which gives us a certain degree of comfort. We can sit back and say, thank God, we have that antique object there to not only demonstrate our wealth, our class position, but in a sense to convince us of the fact that objects have a telos. They have a certain progression. They've come to this point by a certain sequence, which gives us a great deal of comfort. So in this, in this sense, he says flat out, one can thus do a whole psychology or even psychoanalysis of these bygone objects obsession with authenticity, mystique of the past, of origin, symbolic destiny, and other more or less conscious lived aspects. Which, like, absolutely, absolutely. If we think of uh, psychoanalysis in its most, I guess, basic terms, it is the search for a certain experience, a certain traumatic, life-defining, role-defining, character-defining moment that can then be unearthed in order to allow for a certain healing. So Baudrillard is, you know, he says, if we have such an obsession with the antique object, then we must be in a sense susceptible to this sort of psychoana psychoanalytic approach, which he does come to trouble very soon. But he's, in a sense, he says, why not? Like, you, we can apply this, abs this method absolutely, just because of how well it kind of fits just because of how well it, it works with this, with this system. Oh, okay. Water time. Who's hydrate? For those that actually, you know, listen to this, I have to really applaud you. Your uh, attention span is a powerful one. But I digress. Now let's keep going. So he he does he, he from this point in this chapter he propels into certain odd territories. Right, he starts to think about varnish and the cur, the more and then you know the function. Sorry, the moral fanaticism of housekeeping, the prestige of the natural, formal innovation and social discrimination. Each of these is a certain, uh, I guess, part of this chapter in which he looks at, I guess, the more um, specific kind of institutional formations within this class logic, within this system of signs. So, to without... It's difficult to know how... What, what is important in here, but I, let's do this. So in his whole exploration of social logic, in very much the same way, for those that have read Veblen, or those that should definitely go read Veblen, I would recommend, uh, he kind of moves through various uh, instantiations of this class logic. At one point he falls upon fashion. So thinking back to Veblen, what Veblen says off the top of my head is that fashion serves a certain pecuniary role and that it demonstrates one class, one's class. But more than that, for the upper classes, you are awarded more decency, you are awarded, awarded a greater class status if your clothing actually ma performs a maximum inhibition of your ability to move, of, to, of, to in a sense be productive, you know. So the farther removed you can be from, let's say, you know, manual labor or anything of that sort, the better off you'll be as far as class logic goes. So what he says about, what, about fashion in this sort of uh, 
day and age, because right, from Veblen to Baudrillard, or between Veblen and this book, is some 70 years. What Baudrillard writes is, the formal logic of fashion imposes an increased mobility on all the distinctive social signs. So does this formal mobility of signs correspond to a real mobility in social structures, that being of the professional, the political, or the cultural? Certainly not. Absolutely not for him. Fashion, and more broadly, consumption, which is inseparable from fashion, masks a profound social inertia. It itself is a factor of social inertia. Insofar as the demand for real social mobility frolics and loses itself in fashion, in the sudden and often cyclical changes of objects, clothes, cl clothes, clothes and ideas. So it, it would be too convenient if, you know, the fluidity of clothing, the fluidity of fashion matched a certain cultural logic within the fluidity of, I guess, uh, social mobilization or one's ability. I forget the sociological term is eluding me now, but one's ability to cut across different classes, different to break through barriers. I guess a circumvention, there's, there's a, a proper term. I apologize for it eluding me. But it's, it's certainly a, like, a very interesting point in that it's a, it brings the whole idea of fashion into question, suggesting that, in a sense, there isn't, uh, it's not as though there's a trickle-down effect where there's a certain logic within the, you know, logic of capital that then trickles down into fashion, and you can look at fashion and get an idea of what's going on above it. And I use the term above just to put it in this way. Um, but instead, we have to look at these things in different ways, right? We have to approach it in a different logic. It's not as though they're just connected, and that's it. And we can just apply one universal method to analyzing it, because of the example it gives, where it's, you know, we're very fluid with our fashion, but we're not so fluid with crossing occult, uh, social boundaries, class boundaries, and whatnot, which speaks very speaks volumes about the you know our obsession with fashion. What role does that play? Is it a sort of like the antique object, sort of cathartic release? Does it give us the illusion of this sort of movement? Would certainly think so, and that's definitely an idea akin to, you know, Marxism as it manifested itself in, I guess, the mid-20th century with the Herbert Marcuse's of the world. But moving on from here, um, it's, it'd be a good idea to move into his next chapter, which does a very good job at following up. So chapter two, titled The Ideological Genesis of Needs, is moving from this class logic of signification and looking at how do we construct needs? How are, how are needs satisfied? How are they constructed? So on and so forth. So what he says is that, uh, sorry, we believe in consumption. We believe in a real subject motivated by needs and confronted by real objects as sources of satisfaction. It is a thoroughly vulgar metaphysic. In contemporary psychology, sociology, and economic science are all complicit in this fiasco. So the time has come, he says, to deconstruct all the assumptive notions involved. Object, need, aspiration, consumption itself. For it would make as little sense to theorize the quotidian from surface evidence as to interpret the manifest discourse of a dream. It is rather the dream work and the dream processes that must be analyzed in order to recover the unconscious logic of a more profound discourse, which is it hits the point right on the head. If we're dealing with the realm of signs, the realm of signs is what we got to work with. To which he says, the sign object is neither given nor exchanged. It is appropriated, withheld and manipulated by individual subjects as a sign that is as coded difference. Here lies the object of consumption, and it is always of and from a reified, abolished social relationship 
that is signified in a code. Now the term code is one that many people have taken problem with. Taken the task on because he never actually defines it and that's bad. <laughs> but he never gives anyone anything to work off of it. But if we, coming from French, code means in a sense a certain organization or a classification which we can think of it in the, as a verb in the English language is the act of coding something, of making something, I guess, organized. So, I guess I'm going to be defining this term repeatedly throughout, you know, these talks, precisely because it's a very elusive term. But if we think of it in that way, as kind of being the given logic of a certain systemic framework, then I think the code, or the word, the code, lends itself to a fairly accessible uh, analysis. So, what we can do with this idea of a code, in that things become signified in it. What Baudrillard does is he says, okay, there was this split between the object and the sign. And we knew where one was and where the other was. He says, that's all out the window now. Now we have to begin to think of the sign of the signifier as perhaps being as real, if not more real, because how can the object in question exist without the sign? So what can we do then with needs? How are needs can obviously be satisfied in a sense, and of course, coming out of the um, you know Marxist camp, it'd be it would be too quick to say that yeah. Capitalism creates needs, doesn't satisfy them. Of course that's true. But in a sense, we are seeing the satisfaction of too many needs. Where too many needs are being created, too many needs are being satisfied, precisely because it, it exists at the realm of science, right? And these signs are just so multiplicitous. Uh, I have a cat. Want to come here, cat? No? All right. These signs are so multiplicitous that their proliferation is highly extensive. So then Baudrillard comes out with his his logic of signification. And what does signification never mean? Uh, what does it mean? It goes in four steps. So there are four logics. They go as follows. Number one, a functional logic of use value. Number two, an economic logic of exchange value. Number three, a logic of symbolic exchange. Number four, a logic of sign value. So the first, a functional logic of use value. The first is a logic of practical operations. The second, an economic logic of exchange value, is one of equivalence. The third, a logic of symbolic exchange, is ambivalence. And the fourth, a logic of sign value, is difference. Oh, the cat is changing her mind. You want to come up? You want to go up? Make up your mind. So, or again, a logic of utility, a logic of the market, a logic of the gift, and a logic of status, respectively. Logic of status, respectively, moves can also be replaced with these four logics that I just laid out. So, organized in accordance with one of the above groupings, the object assumes, respectively, the status of an instrument, a commodity, a symbol, or a sign, and that it can't necessarily be divorced from that. It can't necessarily be taken out of its particular context. So an object is not an object of consumption unless it is released from its psychic determination as symbol, from its functional determinations as instrument, from its commercial dominations as project, pro product, and is thus liberated as a sign to be recaptured by the formal logic of fashion, for example, i.e. by the logic of differentiation, in that it's opened up into this new possibility, into this new realm, and then it's given its value, in a sense. It's given its ability to be a thing among other signified things, which is where its tr true value lies, right? I would certainly think so. So then, uh, well, obviously, he goes on to say that there is no object of consumption 
before the moment of its substitution. And without this substitution having been determined by the social law, which demands not only the renewal of distinctive material, but the obligatory registration of individuals on the scale of status through the mediation of their group and as a function of their relations excuse me, with other groups. Again, sort of reiterating much of the same stuff, is that um, these objects are only given this status once they've kind of lost their position as, you know, real objective objects, if you will. It seems paradoxical. Um, but that is the argument that he's, he's certainly trying to push here. He's trying to think of it in these terms. So if we think of exchange as an operation between two separated terms, each existing in isolation prior to the exchange, one has to establish the existence of the exchange itself in a double obligation, that of giving and that of returning. And again, we're reminded of Marcel Mauss's uh, theory of the gift, where you don't just give a gift unconditionally. That doesn't exist. There's always a return. There's always going to be some kind of transference of the energy attached to that initial gift in the form of a counter gift, in the form of a don't inference, which can also, you know, I believe the language used in French would be uh, is don't, which is can be gift, but also donation, which is certainly interesting. Because, you know, in our cultural framework, we wouldn't ever ever want to think of a donation as being something that's conditional. We wouldn't want to think of donation as being something that elevates our class status. And I don't even want to think that way. And I will never think that way. There are good ways to exist in the world that benefit people unconditionally. But it is important to keep into consideration and reveals in sense perhaps the limitations of our own attempts at being good, attempts at being benevolent. So one could, here we're getting odd, to become an end in itself, every system must dispel the question of its real teleology through the meritorious meretricious legitimacy of needs and satisfactions, the entire question of the social and political finality of productivity is repressed. But this is precisely the problem. In the, the attempt to recapture this discourse, the analysis of modern society reproduces the misconstruction of naive anthropology. It naturalizes the processes of exchange and signification, which are not natural. We cannot think of these terms as being something that exists forever, for always, but again, it meets a certain logical system. It's a certain logical framework. It's a certain ideological system at the same time. So, in effect, the origin of meaning is never found in the relation between a subject, given a priori as autonomous and conscious, and an object produced for rational ends, that is, properly. The economic relation, rationalized in terms of choice and calculation, is to be found rather in difference, systematizable in terms of a code as opposed to private calculation, a differential structure that establishes the social relation and not the subject as such. So, it's so much to unpack. It's difficult to kind of crowd these talks into an hour or so. The origin of meaning is never found in the relation between a subject and an object. It's difficult to put that into words without just repeating the basic logic up until this point, and I won't try to. However, I will say that the intersection of the sign and of the individual formulates, or the individual as a sign and the sign of the object. So we're meeting on the plane of signs here. 
formulates the condition for the realization of the individual. But it's an individual that is not at all connected to, you know, your basic biological framework, right? Like a body without organs type thing, uh, to follow out of um, Deleuze. Guattari, I should say. But there is, to what extent then does this idea of the individual, does the idea of the even the consumer itself, how does it become problematized? How do we break out of that, even that framework? And the later, it's, it's difficult to say what Baudrillard thinks about subjectivity. Because on one, one end of the spectrum, you know, we have the Baudrillard kind of, what I'll call like a conservative type thinker, thinking that we're all screwed um, because of our, you know, technological apparatuses and how it's ultimately going to lead to our downfall as humans, whatever that might mean. But on the other end, you have a thinker that's very, very optimistic. And there, there, I've had so many conversations with people that have said, you know, Baudrillard's just a nihilist, very cynical, um, which is all good in its own right, but you have to read them as such. And it's, it's not an idea that I, it's never been made clear to me. He strikes me as a profoundly happy thinker, but it's difficult to say because he's, he wants to think about possibility. Possibility in the wake of apocalypse, a possibility in the desert. What does it mean to be, you know, a thinker? What does it mean to perform theory? What does it mean to do philosophy today? Which, in a sense, is very... Again, I... <coughs> I digress, I digress. We return now to the discussion of fashion. So t for him, to take a recent example, neither the logic, the long skirt, nor the mini skirt has an absolute value in itself. Only their differential relation acts as a criterion of meaning. The mini skirt has nothing whatsoever to do with sexual liberation. It has no fashion value except in opposition to the long skirt. This value is of course reversible. The voyage from the mini skirt, the maxi skirt, will have the same distinctive and selective fashion value as the reverse, and it precipitates the same effect of beauty, which is, it's not a radical idea. Obviously, these things are, you know, part of this code. It's something that has to be, we learn. You don't come out of the womb. You don't, you know, have your first, your first breaths and think, God, I'm, I really love mini skirts like in this example it's something that you that you learn um so it would seem then for him and what he says is it would appear that a theory of needs has no meaning only a theory of the ideological concept of need would make any sense again suggesting that we have to get on the plane of the sign if we are to even have a discussion about what needs are we have to take the sign as being as real in that it can produce effects and that it has consequences as, you know, the objective knock on the table world. And we even get here as early as this text, you know, the beginnings of his or traces of his pessimistic view where he says that <laughs> if he eats drinks lives somewhere reproduces himself it is because the system requires his self-production in order to reproduce itself it needs men who knows why it has to be men he says it if it could function with slaves there would be no free workers if it could function with asexual mechanical robots there would be no sexual reproduction if the system could function without feeding its workers, there would be no bread. It is in the sense that we are all, in the framework of the system, survivors. Not even the instinct of self-preservation is fundamental. It is a social tolerance or a social imperative. When the system requires it, it cancels this instinct and people get excited about dying. For a sublime cause, evidently. On that note, he moves into... His third chapter, called The Fetishism and Ideology, The Semiological Reduction, which, a little note, 
this article first appeared in 1970. So the, he begins by saying the concepts of commodity fetishism and money fetishism sketched for Marx the lived ideology of capitalist society. The mode of sanctification, fascination, and psychological subjection by which individuals internalize the general system of exchange value. So, he says, while Marx still attached it, sorry, while Marx still attached it, though very ambiguously, to a form, the commodity, money, and thus located in it at a theoretically comprehensive level, today the concept of fetishism is exploited in a summary and empirical fashion. Object fetishism, automobile fetishism, sex fetishism, vacation fetishism. Now this is opening up very interesting terrain, where if we're only dealing with the domain of science, and like he said earlier, we could certainly lend this to um, a certain psychological or psychoanalytic analysis, what sense can we make then of the fetish, you know, the automobile fetish, fetish with consuming certain objects. What, what, what is going on there? Surely, for Baudrillard, that's not due to some, you know, deep-rooted psychological issue. It's not due to some, you know, fundamental locus of, you know, whatever, whether it be the conditions of production or the psyche or whatever, but it must operate at the level of science. So here, we are interested sorry we are, here we are interested in the extension of the fetishist metaphor in modern industrial society insofar as it enmeshes critical analysis liberal or marxist within the subtle trap of a rationalistic anthropology what else is intended by the concept of commodity fetishism if not the notion of a false consciousness devoted to the worship of exchange value all of this presupposes the existence somewhere of a non-alienated consciousness of an object in some true objective state its use value again getting this kind of fear of attaching it to a certain moment to a certain idea to a certain real experience so marxism eliminates any real chance it has of analyzing the actual process of ideological labor by refusing to analyze the structures and the mode of ideological production inherent in its own logic, Marxism is condemned behind the facade of a dialectical discourse in terms of the class struggle to expanding the reproduction of ideology and thus of the capitalist system itself, an idea that in his next book, The Mirror of Production, we will uh, flesh out much more, much more deeply. So the fetish in, in this framework is something that is not an obsession with that true moment, with that objective moment, with that objective thing, but it's actually an obsession with the value associated with signs and where does value come from. Uh, it's free-floating in a sense. It's not something that just exists per se. So that, that is to say that... Um, I'm sorry, my nose is itchy. Behind this reinterpretation, which is truly ideological, it is a fetishism of the signifier, where that is where fetishism lies. That is to say, that the subject is trapped in the fractitious, differential, encoded, systematized aspect of the object. It is not the passion, whether of objects or subjects, for substances that speak, that speaks in fetishism. It is the passion for the code, again, this idea coming up, which by governing both objects and subjects, and by subordinating them to itself, delivers them up to abstract manipulation. This is the fundamental articulation of the ideological process, not in the produ projection of alienated consciousness into various superstructures, but in the generalization, generalization at all levels of a structural code. And this, in a sense, gives us an idea of how the logic of fetishism, that which is fetishized, is not universal. and we may open up this domain to various subcultures that are different, you know, across time and space. Different if you have the same kind of capitalist mode of expenditure or a capitalist mode of production operating in one state and another. This, uh, the logic of fetishism would not 
fold it, come out in the same way. Which is what Baudrillard's getting at when he's thinking of the the code, how in any given kind of framework, excuse me, it'll be formulated around that given paradigm or that given kind of those accepted parameters. So it is the it is rather the ambivalent fascination for a form, logic of the commodity or a system of exchange value, a state of absorption for better or for worse in the restrictive logic of a system of abstraction in which these things come to be they come into formulation they come they come they pop into the world so what we are <laughs> what we are talking about then he says is a kind of anti-nature incarnate bound up in a general stereotype of models of beauty in a perfectionist vertigo and controlled narcissism this is the absolute rule with respect to the face and the body the generalization of sign exchange value to facial and bodily effects, where the body is introduced in order to liquidate the unconscious in its work, to strengthen the one and homogenous the subject, the one, and, excuse me, to strengthen the one and homogenous subject, keystone of this system of values and order, where things are given a great deal of value. Take for instance pornography where pornography doesn't lend itself to um, the realm of signs, even though that's exact, precisely what it is. Perhaps we can think of pornography as being that thing which claims there, or gives us the idea that there's natural human body that has a biology, that's a physiology, from which desires are developed, from which you know, our wants and needs develop, which is just a strategy. It's a systemic strategy to convince us of that, to remove us from the world as sign, from the world as symbol. And then, if we follow Baudrillard's logic, it would then keep us from being able to analyze the world, to analyze the system in that way, precisely because we'd be approaching it from the wrong domain. We wouldn't be on equal footing. So, he goes on to say that nudity claims to be rational, progressive. It claims to rediscover the truth of the body, its natural reason, beyond clothing, taboos, and fashion. In fact, it is too rationalistic and bypasses the body, whose symbolic and sexual truth is not in the naive conspicuousness of nudity, but in the uncovering of itself, mise en insofar as it is the symbolic equivalent of putting to death, mise à mal, and thus of the true path of desire, which is always ambivalent, love and death, simultaneously, where the pornogra or pornography marks the death of the body as such, because it brings it into being. It makes it apparent, I'm trying to think of a, an analogy for that, where it's only when the thing is revealed that it dies, Perhaps there's a film in which such a thing is elucidated or illustrated, but I can't think of one. But it's when the body loses its symbolic function, when the body loses its status as a sign, as something that is illusory in a sense, that we see, you know, the rise of pornography and the death of the body, of the human, of, of whatever. Of course, it's important. And I think that there are um, certainly implications for this idea in relation to like, feminist thought, gender studies. Uh, it's, it's certainly one, ter one domain that has thought very seriously about pornography. Um, but in what way there is a desire, a very profound desire to get at the heart of what being a human is, which perhaps is a good, I guess, a methodological point to resist, or a certain um, thing to resist, where we, we have to avoid trying to get to that idea of what a real human being is, what a fake one, what the realm of signs are, in order to really understand the world in its own terms, which is something that we perhaps are not as faithful to as we should. So and to be even more relevant, uh, Baudrillard goes on to say, thinking about 
men and women, or the masculine and the feminine. He says, no being is assigned by nature to a sex. And of course, the implications for this. And at the time, you know, 1972, but this one was written in 1970, the, these ideas were rather radical, which I don't want this to undermine, you know, the work done by, you know, feminist scholarship at the time. But to take up this idea of the arbitrary nature of sex, as far as feminist thought goes, it really comes after second wave feminism. So I'm thinking the 80s, the early 80s, the late, later 70s, and intersectional feminism. But Baudrillard was able to bypass a lot of barriers, you know, partly because of his own privilege, to get to this point, right? He was able to say, you know, I'm just going to talk about simulation, and it would naturally follow then that, you know, sex is arbitrary, gender is arbitrary, all that, all that stuff would necessarily follow. Which, be it as it, be that as it may, it's certainly interesting, and it's, it, it's opens up a lot of interesting, interesting territories. So he takes this proposition so much further to suggest that the. The unconscious, the contemporary unconscious, is diffused by the mass media, celebrated by semiology, but still given a substance that is individualized and personalized. Today, everyone has an unconscious. It's mine, it's yours, his, hers. The structure and work of the unconscious is primarily a challenge of the, unco of the conscious subject. Here, then, the possessive pronoun is itself semiologically reductive and ideologically effective insofar as it reduces this unconscious to a... Cliffhanger, simple opposition or term vis-a-vis -vis consciousness. So, in this day and age, there's we very much like the idea of the unconscious. It's very it's a very effective strategy to convince us of our, you know, psyche. So he says to each his own unconscious, his own symbolic d deposit to exploit, his capital, and shortly there will be the right to the unconscious. The habeas corpus of Homo cyberneticus, that is, the transfer of bourgeois liberties into a domain that everywhere escapes them and which denies them. To think of, to put it in terms of the Homo cyberneticus, thinking of this idea of subjectivity for Baudrillard as being something that, that you know, it's kind of forced upon us. We aren't, we're, in a sense, we're gifted to subjectivity to which we have to respond. How do we respond with a gift of that magnitude? So he then says, the myth of the unconscious becomes in itself the ideological solution to the problem of the unconscious. In that it, like the you know sociological frameworks he was addressing at the beginning, kind of lays its own foundation, kind of uh, lays the framework for it to then be affirmed retroactively by evaluating that framework. It's very, it's certainly an interesting critique, but it all points to Baudrillard's theory of simulation. It all points to the status of things as signs, as not objects per se, but as things that float. So, which, in his words, this abstract totalization of things as signs, under the, under the aegis of the code, permits signs to function ideologically, that is, to establish and perpetuate real discriminations and the order of power. Just because, to the logic of science, which he believes permeates, it can, there is a thing called power, and it, it can work on that plane. But unless we adopt a theoretical method to approach it, we won't be able to challenge that power in that way. We would, won't be able to get at the get to the heart of it. And I think that that's a, a good point uh, for me to stop here, at the end of chapter three, before moving into um, the next chapter. Where from here on out, it gets a little bit more technical. He thinks about the relationship between the signifier and the signified a little more in relation to Marx. But there are also brief moments of resistance, where he theorizes the possibility of resistance in rather interesting ways. But we'll get to that then.
But for anyone that made it this far, thank you. If you have anything you want to add, any questions, please, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, but other than that, I hope everyone has a good weekend, and hopefully see you next time. All right, thanks.